Hi, everybody. Hopefully you can hopefully uh, hear and see me okay. Yes, that's fine. A small little little bit of internet glitch this morning. What else would be the perfect start of the day? Uh, this is AdRoll, right? AdRoll Live. I'm Laura Finiti. I'm the Multimedia Content Manager at AdRoll. And uh, we host these live streams every Wednesday. It's 10.30 a.m. here in San Francisco. So we try and stick with the same time. Uh, wherever you're joining from, though, we'd love to know. So give us a shout in the chat, whether you're watching on Facebook or you're watching on LinkedIn, you can send your questions and your comments to us throughout the live stream today for our guests and on our panel that we've got going on here this morning. Um, if you watched last week, you will have seen that my living room uh, is a kind of a state of chaos because I'm in the process of moving and a week later, I haven't really gotten much further. It's still a complete mess. Um, but I feel like this kind of suits today's topic because we're going to be speaking a little bit about burnout um, for managing event and content burnout. Um, the mental space, uh, I feel like is pretty, my mental space is pretty well reflected by my home space right now. It's kind of cluttered and a little bit chaotic. Uh, so this feels like the perfect, uh, the perfect topic. Um, before we get into introducing our guests here this morning, I just want to tell you a little bit about um, what we're going to be covering today and who's going to be joining us. We've got Lauren Fairbanks, who is the uh, is a partner and CEO of SMG Content Manage, uh, Marketing, which is Stunt and Gimmicks Content Marketing. We're also going to be joined by Jamie Lee, who is from AdRoll, and she's my boss. Uh, she, she is the head of all of the uh, content at, um, at AdRoll. And then we have Steph as well from AdRoll, who is the um, head of community. On our team um, so really excited to join them all soon um, so as I was saying we're all kind of living in this current work from home situation uh, we've been through a bit of a roller coaster I mean currently there is estimated to be 2.6 billion people that's one third of the world's population that are living under some kind of lockdown or quarantine so this is arguably the biggest psychological experiment experiment we've ever really conducted um, I know from my from my own personal experience, um, I have a bit of a lethargic vibe going on at the moment. Usually, you know, I, I get up, start work, maybe 8.30 a.m. At the moment, though, I kind of struggling to find the energy to really sit down and get focused at 9 a.m. It can take me an extra half an hour just to get started. And then when I get working, my creative juices just aren't like they normally are. You know, I'm missing a little bit of that inspiration. So my deadlines are a little bit like behind, perhaps, you know, they get pushed by a few days. And then when you get to the weekend, which everyone's still excited for, everyone always looks forward to the weekend, you still end up feeling like you're tired, like you don't really feel fully refreshed. Um, so I feel like, you know, I'm not too concerned about saying this out loud because I feel like most people feel the same way. You know, I've heard it from family. I've heard it from friends and also colleagues as well. Um, when it comes to online, of course, we've had a whole, uh, everyone's kind of went online to start with to try and pass the time and to try and keep entertained, a lot of social media. Um, so that activity really soared since lockdown. Um, but as the weeks wear on, we're feeling like we're, we're kind of hitting a phase of fatigue, frustration and burnout. Um, so to stay relevant, you know, as a company, it's something that us ourselves as ad role are focusing on, as well as other brands and other companies are trying to find ways that they can monitor, you know, social users and offer content that really, really meets their needs. Um, so with that, let's get our, our guest here introduced. I'm going to bring him on into the live stream this morning and would like to welcome there we go, uh, Lauren, Jamie and Scott. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, okay. oh, there we go. I can hear you now. There was a slight delay. I was like, uh oh, there's no sound. Um, this is the first time we've had like this many people on a live stream. So we're looking a bit like the Brady Bunch with this lineup. I'm loving it. <laughs> Honored to be a part of this first experiment. <laughs> Same. <laughs> um, perfect. Okay, so first of all, I mean, let's let's get started. In, uh, we've got kind of several different perspectives to to look at this morning. Obviously, as I say, like uh, so, Lauren works um, with content marketing um, from an agency perspective, working with multiple brands, multiple companies. Steph works a lot with community with our um, our GGC community at, at AdRoll, which is direct to consumer um community and then jamie of course works with myself working on things like this like live streams and blog posts and different types of content um for consumers so uh who would like to volunteer themselves first just to speak a little bit about like what they've seen in terms of engagement um during during lockdown or the initial weeks of lockdown i can i can go um i pay a, a lot of attention to our traffic of course and um, so I'll highlight that we noticed really big spikes in um, the, the page sessions and page views that we saw. We 
before the lockdown to the beginning of the lockdown, we saw about a two and a half to three times jump in the traffic to our content pages. So like our resources pages and our blogs. Um, and then from that, within that, our organic traffic also jumped um, and it was around like eight and a half times. Um, so I think that really told us that people were navigating this crazy world that we were now living in. Um, but since that, we have gone over this hump and we've kind of stabilized back to normal numbers before the lockdown. So I think, and then uh, uh, recent events, even like with the protests. So now that's like a new thing that's been thrown into the mix. And um, I think people have gotten a sense of how to navigate or at least brands when it comes to the pandemic. Um, but maybe political things are now a new element that brands need to consider. Um, so I think we're at another ground zero, if you will, like trying to understand what the next thing is that people are trying to find. Um, but then going back to what you were talking about, Laura, maybe there's a sense of fatigue. Um, so maybe also taking a deeper dive into the psychological aspect and trying to figure out how do we really deliver value without just pushing our agenda. Yeah, um, I can I can go next because what I've seen um, just from just from the community and from talking to community members, um, you know, echoes that pretty pretty spot on. When COVID really started to hit the world it, at the end of February, early March, um, there was a huge spike in terms of D2C marketers having an appetite to join the GTC community and chat in the Slack group and participate in community meetups. Um, and that really makes sense because, you know, it was like, whoa, like what is going on? I want to hear like if other people are seeing similar things in terms of the growth and engagement with their brand. Um, you know, there were crazy things happening with the with the cost of ads, and people really wanted to to chat with other people who um, who do what they do, so they could level set. And since then, we've kind of seen. Um, I mean, like things are still crazy, and we're still facing a lot of changes, but we're kind of in this new norm, so to speak. I think people have adjusted to um, living in a in a pandemic, so to speak, and um you know we are still facing challenges and changes and but like but they're less severe um and because we've been facing them for quite a long time now several months um people um community members myself included have kind of just like hit a point where um it's hard to to give extra energy and extra mental space um to to activities so for example um the first couple of meetups that we that we held in march for the community had great registration good turnout like really active conversation and then pretty much after that next couple of weeks um we saw a big dip by by almost 50 percent in the follow-up meetups that we had. Um, and so we've kind of pumped the brakes on those. Um, and then myself, like I've noticed lately when I personally respond to like RSVP yes to a webinar or an event or something like that, um, I found myself actually not not going as much just because it's um, it does require energy to like hop on and have conversations and um, like be engaged for for a large chunk of time. Um, and I, you know, I am feeling a little a little bit of burnout just with with everything that um, we've we've been facing over the last couple of months, and that's certainly reflected with um, D 2 C marketers marketers too. So, yeah. And I can, I really just going to kind of reiterate what Jamie and Steph said, but from the agency perspective, you know, we work with both B2B and B2C clients. So really across the board, we've seen kind of, we saw this huge increase in engagement with online platform, whether that be blog posts, webinars, 
white papers, eBooks that were helping people kind of navigate this new normal, both from a personal perspective, so how to kind of stay sane, how to create this new work environment, but also from, you know, how to be more effective, how to make sure that you're hitting your deadlines, how to make sure that you are still building culture with your, with your employees and your team members. Um, and that was really kind of over March and April. And I think now that we're hitting May and June, we've seen a pretty massive slide into people just disengaging. And I think a lot of that is due to the fact that people really are burnt out. Um, you know, it started with the pandemic and then there have been a lot of other, you know, a lot of other events that have kind of compounded this issue and just made, you know, just kind of this overwhelming amounts of information. All of these events are important and are critical and are really, you know, they're taking a lot of mind space from people. So people just don't have the, the brain space to really think about work or personal lives and people are just feeling like they, they can't kind of handle anything else. Um, and then I think that's also compounded by the fact that it's June and now people's vacation schedules and time off schedules are also being affected by this. So there's kind of this extra level of, you know, they were anticipating for a long time being able to get out and go on vacation or visit family. And now that a lot of these plans are being canceled or being dramatically altered, that's at kind of adding this additional layer of, oh, you know, like, what are we gonna do now? So it's just really, it's pushing people to kind of disengage even further. I did have a diagram here, which I thought I'd, I'd show. This is from like um, a something else. I was doing some research, obviously, for the topic over the past uh, day. And um, this figure here is from, you know, a study from like 1989, I think it was, but phases of response to disaster. Um, slightly wonky looking that, uh, graphic we've got going on here. But as you can see, obviously, we've got warning impact honeymoon stage, which I think we did all go through where this is kind of like, oh, like, you know, uh, we'll indulge in some of these, you know, new habits or work from home excite a little bit of excitement even maybe and then you just see that absolute dip of a roller coaster that goes right down to basically like a I'd feel like where we are right now <laughs> potentially um and then you know you do see obviously unfortunately that potential second disaster pending um but I guess the the bonus of you know this kind of wave is that you see there the enhanced community and individual adaption so once people figure out that balance once people kind of um perhaps come to terms with the situation and um you know kind of go up a little bit more to a more static more more consistent and um kind of a uh, uh feeling and vibe uh, energy you know uh that they had pre to the the disaster but i thought this was just interesting to show in the in the sense that um obviously this is for a uh, wide spectrum of, dis of disasters, not necessarily just for a pandemic, but we absolutely are following a trend. So there's some comfort in knowing that like, this is not unexpected, I guess, even though it feels it as, as, a, as a, on a personal level and on a business level. I think what's interesting is that a lot of people are realizing now that we're all kind of sharing these same, you know, feelings of, you know, starting out feeling really motivated and all of a sudden just kind of gradually losing focus and not caring as much. Um, but I've been reading about, you know, what psychologists are calling the, the caution fatigue or caution fatigue. And basically it's that you start out really motivated because you see the pandemic or any kind of crisis as an opportunity to kind of make changes and you want to stay on track. But over time, when you're in this kind of heightened state of stress for long periods of time, your body just kind of starts to break down. Like you really just can't handle continuing to motivate yourself or set goals when there's, especially when there's not an end in sight. We don't really know when the pandemic is gonna be over. We've got all of these additional kind of social unrest and civic issues that are compounding this. And I think a lot of people just don't really know when the, the end is. So we don't have anything to really kind of gauge like this is how much longer we have to kind of push through this. I definitely can relate to the, the beginning and kind of that heightened, excited psychological state where I felt very motivated um, and I had no problem putting in 12, 14 hours a day. And I was like, this is, I'm working from home. It's, you know, it's easy. Um, but it, there definitely is that fatigue that hits you. And I think that with all of the events that are happening, we're um, hopefully, like you said, Laura, with your, your graph more towards the bottom and maybe coming up as we start to figure out a little bit more how to navigate as individuals. Um, I do think that there's a really big psychological element to this. And 
as a brand or someone who's trying to engage with consumers. Um, I do think that psychographics or having a better understanding of individuals and a holistic view of who they are will start to play out a little bit more as a trend. Um, and, and, I, and I think just on a personal level, taking a more concerted effort to have balance in my day and a routine. I was thinking about this, like what really makes a difference between like going into an office and interacting with people versus doing it digitally. Um, and I, I don't know if it's just like having that routine of like locking your door, getting in your car um, and going out. So I'm trying to kind of add that variety into my life. Um, even though I'm not going into an office or I'm not talking to my colleagues in person. Um, so I'll let you know if that's going to help my mental state, just getting in my car and driving maybe in the morning to go get coffee. I think that's really interesting because I've been thinking about the same thing. And I think one of the things that I miss about being in an office space is having these little spontaneous breaks where I might stop and talk to a coworker or I might, you know, go get a cup of coffee and take a walk around the block. All of these things kind of help break up the day and make it more manageable. And they also kind of give you an opportunity to engage with other people and maybe be a little more creative. But when you're working from home, I notice I will sit in my chair at my desk for eight hours straight. And then at the end of the day, I'm wondering why do I feel so exhausted? And it's because I just haven't really had that kind of natural break in my day to, you know, kind of take a mental break or walk around, get some fresh air. Yeah, definitely. And then um, one, of the, one of our community members brought up a great point um, in a conversation that we were having last week. And he was saying that um, well, I hadn't really thought about this myself, but he was saying like now to have moments of connection with your teammates on collaborative projects, um, whereas like in an office when your desk used to be right next to your teammate, you could be like, hey, do you have a sec? Like, I'd love your thoughts on this or I have a question or whatever it is. You could have that organic moment of conversation, but now there's a mental load of having to like, okay, I have this thought, I want Jamie's input on it. Okay, now I have to schedule a meeting with Jamie and I have to remember to write down what I wanted to ask her about. And then I actually have to like open up my calendar and have the meeting. Um, yeah. So he's like, I spend my whole nine to five um, in meetings now. He manages a team, like a, a fairly good sized team of people. And um, then he gets off at the end of the day and he has dinner with his with his family and then he gets back on and he um, does some heads down work when everybody else is offline. So he was just like, just the fact that I have to coordinate and schedule every type of interaction that I need to have with my team is taking up so much more like actual time and also mental energy that I'm now less likely to um, be as open to like joining a webinar or um, even like reading, you know, I used to be an avid reader of the news every morning and now I just like, I need to get in and like start my work. Um, so just recognizing that like communication, although like we do have all these awesome ways to digitally communicate with each other, um, it's a lot more taxing than it is to just turn to your teammate to your left or your right or walk over to their desk pod. Um, and that in itself is creating an extra like layer of fatigue in our day to day and how we manage our work. I did um, see a statistic that it was like people on average have 16% extra meetings on their calendar than they did obviously wow. before this. So that's yeah. a huge amount, you know, 16% as yeah. an average. So some people perhaps have way more and, and some maybe have less. But I'd also seen here that uh, mentions of Zoom. So this was from Sparkloft Media did a um, some screening over, you know, hundreds of thousands of social accounts and mentions of Zoom fell from 65% positive in March to just 53 positive in April. So within a month, in terms of the positive speak that people were, uh, you know, conversations people were having around Zoom as a communication tool um, fell by, you know, over 10% there, which is quite, you know, for one month is a lot. Um, but also I think a lot of people had this feeling of when we first started obviously having Zoom calls and chest testing out filters and having fun conversations like that, like now it's just, as Steph was saying, like that's extra effort on top of whatever, if you're doing 16% meetings more in a, in a, a day, you know, on a week and for work, uh, extending that into your personal life is, is kind of like even less uh, alluring, <laughs> let's say. Yeah. So yeah. 
So then I think as marketers, like it's it's really important to, um, as Jamie mentioned earlier, to really understand the like life experiences and feelings that your audience is going through, and then be able to adjust how you are communicating with them and engaging them with your with your product and your and your brand and the content that you're putting out. Um, because for example, like maybe somebody doesn't have as much energy to, um, I don't know, read a, like read something for a while or doesn't have as much time in their day. Like maybe they would enjoy watching like a five minute video clip that they can do on demand or something like that. Um, so just kind of figuring out how to, it's really just meeting your customers where they are. Um, I think it was like the way that marketers can continue to be successful through these um, like ever-changing times that, that we're going through. I think that's a really important point. And I think a lot of what brands really need to do right now is pay attention and listen. Because I think one thing that we've really learned by talking to our friends and family through this is that everyone kind of goes through these stages of dealing with crisis differently. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's kind of evident when we're going to talk about the like the three different sort of like crisis personalities, but it's really, really critical for brands to look at what, how their customers are responding to the brand communications, responding to their social posts, responding to their emails, their blog posts, mm -hmm. and really see like, are we putting out the right kind of content and is it resonating well? And if it's not, what kind of content do you need to create in order to meet your customers and your audience where they are in their own personal journey dealing with this kind of enhanced state of crisis? Probably a good chance, a good moment actually to bring up some of these different types of online personalities. And I think that um, uh, everybody can kind of recognize maybe themselves in one of these categories or people that they know in these categories. Um, so, say, so first of all, this is again, this is actually from Sparkloft as well, who uh, from some of the, the research that they've done. So, they identified three different groups um, of kind of online activity or, or kind of personas. So first was the activists. So these are the people who took to social to discuss, share information and educate. Um, and so, you know, at this stage now, like that was their intention to start with. Now they're experiencing kind of an information overload um, and some ideas on how, you know, to perhaps communicate or to engage with this type of audience now is basically, you know, uh, like as have you posted call to actions, encouraging followers to join your effort, share the results that you had. Um, so if, if you did any polls or if you if you've tried to encourage kind of any um, type of interaction, then you can show the results of that. Um, sharing good news and keeping messaging hopeful and positive and reminding you know your followers that it's okay to take breaks and to, to give time to yourself and, and to kind of like indulge in that aspect. Uh, the next on the line there was uh, the curators. So they saw quarantine and um, as a time of self improvement. And I always feel like, I don't know who these people are. And I could not do it. I could not do it. I hated it. I don't know if you guys saw all those like memes that went round, or not memes, but they were like, you know, post people like, if you've not, if you don't achieve anything during quarantine, you've wasted your time. And it made me so angry because I was like, <laughs> You know, a, a pandemic is not the time to be, you know, really like try and focus on, on imp self improvement necessarily. Um, but some people, however, saw it as a time of self improvement. Uh, so at the stage they're at now, you know, the challenges of lost novelty, there's pressure to be productive begins to feel arduous. And if you have a job, of course, that, that really plays into it. So um, you're shifting messaging to self care um, from productivity to rest encouraging screenless experiences so you don't have this kind of cloud living and cloud living exhaustion. Um, sharing things like Spotify lists, recommended audiobooks, podcasts or guided meditations, anything that can kind of bring some, some relaxation. Um, and then the third category here is the escapists. So those who wanted to, to get away from, from COVID and uh, use social to replace activities that they missed. So, um, then now they've kind of again hit this stage of overload i guess of information and content and, and watching and kind of consuming content um but they're they're uh, looking in and returning to old favorites instead of new content so you know maybe it's nostalgia found through tv shows uh by rerunning programs you've already seen before that you enjoyed because you just it's mindless and not mindless but it just takes you back to that place of nostalgia that's comfortable 
um, you know, leaning into normal messaging. So not talking about COVID so much. I feel like Jamie could potentially speak to this in just a moment in terms of what we've done with with ad roll, mess, um, you know, with messaging and trying to read what people maybe want from us. Um, and avoiding mentioning the pandemic and just bringing, bringing an element of, of normality. Um, so I don't know if any, either if, if any of you identify as being those, in those categories yourself, but um, and you know maybe some ideas that you have around those categories. I am definitely an escapist, uh, which is why I was excited about this um, live stream because I think that I'm hoping that I'm not alone out there. Um, just looking at our own engagement numbers with content, I feel like there's a lot of other escapists. So um, it sounds like a cool thing to be an escapist, but <laughs> not. I think it actually comes with a lot of mental, emotional, physical fatigue. Um, and so on the, for us, what we're trying to do to address that with our audience is, um, is to kind of, like you mentioned on your slide, go back to what uh, we were doing before the pandemic. So everything was like, what's going on in the pandemic? How do we uh, manage uh, our business? All of that stuff. Um, so we're going back into what our brand stands for, how we can help direct to consumer brands. And we're kind of like in the, the middle of that listening period, because I think that there's still other layers of messaging, but we we're definitely moving far, far away from any uh, survive and thrive type of messaging. Um, and me, I'll just speak to a, a content consumer uh, or me being as a content consumer and an escapist, I have sh definitely shut down. I would probably uh, view a live stream or a webinar every other week. Um, and that I, I haven't seen a webinar, at least none that aren't our own uh, since the pandemic um, and this lockdown that we're in. But there was a an email that I got this week that I actually opened. I haven't been really good at opening any emails from brands um, just because I, I think that I've also kind of been on this journey of like working from home and trying to navigate um, and stay mentally sane. Um, but I opened this email because it was about, it was humorous and it was from this brand that was inviting me and my friends and family to a comedy show. And I'm a huge fan of laughing <laughs> and humor. Uh, I definitely, that's my, my escape method is just to watch things or watch like shows on Netflix or uh, stand up comedy that can just let me escape in that moment. And so I thought it was really interesting because it was from a, a technology brand um, and it had nothing to do with technology. It was just a literal lineup of comedians and I could invite my friends and family. And I thought that was an interesting play um, because it's so disconnected from the brand or at least I didn't see the, the connection and it felt like a really honest and genuine um, effort to engage with the audience and get us excited on a personal level with like hobbies and interests. I wanted to, I know I'd, I'd been speaking with Steph actually uh, recently about an experience you had with a community member um, who was speaking about just with Jamie mentioning email there, um, that one of the habits of one of our customers um, with email consumption has somewhat changed recently. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the type of email that this customer, well, he used to he used to read email newsletters specifically. Um, there were a few that he liked, and he would do it on his commute to work. Um, so I think like realizing that a lot of content that people consume in their free time, they they do in moments like that in their day where they're kind of. Um, they have like an hour, 30 minutes, whatever it is to like sit and listen to it or sit and read it. Um, and although we we have, I guess, technically more time because we're not commuting to the office, we don't have that space that we're giving ourselves to, to do that type of activity. So for me, for example, I'll get up in the morning, um, I'll have coffee, I'll walk my dog. Um, but I'm not then going on my commute where I would normally listen to a podcast. Um, that piece is totally skipped and I jump right into my into my work. Um, so long story short, he's stopped consuming his email newsletters. Um, and then so in addition to like having that behavior change in in his day, um, he's also felt like 
Um, it's just a little too noisy right now. I think, I think that while digital communication is, is awesome and it's great that we have all of these ways to continue connecting and working and learning and things like that. Um, I mean, we're human beings. Like I am not an expert and it's been a long time since I've studied any of this, but um, you know, there's a reason that like babies who are more prematurely survive and thrive a lot better when, you know, it, humans can put their hands into the incubator and like touch the babies. Um, there are people who, um, elderly people who live alone and don't have a lot of social interactions actually have shorter lifespans than elderly people who don't live alone and or who have like an active social life. Like we are just social creatures and there is something about physically being with people um, that brings energy to you in one way or another. It's the reason why, um, like even though going to a yoga class for me, it's not really a social experience. I'm not really talking to anybody, but like being in that environment with people all doing the same thing is energizing for me. Um, so yeah, long story short, there's just everything that we're doing is digital, whether it's um, reading the news or listening to a podcast or doing our work or having happy hour with our friends. And we're kind of just hit this point where we don't have like the personal like mental space or the energy to, to do it. And so I think as marketers, we kind of need to recognize that um, is what people are experiencing. And maybe instead of, you know, sending an email newsletter once a week, maybe for the next couple months, it makes sense to do it every other week or once a month and like be more selective about what you put in there. Um, so just kind of adjusting based off of like what people have the capacity to, to intake now um, and recognizing that their routines are, they're not the same anymore. I think that's a really good point, Steph, that you brought up um, about the fact that, you know, I think being in a super connected world has been kind of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, you know, since we're all socially distanced, being able to have that interaction is great because you're right, as humans, like we really need to have that interaction with people in order to stay sane and feel happy. Um, on the other hand, I think it's also really complicated the, the way that we all cope because now it's really kind of hard to moderate every touch point that we have digitally. Like you said before, you know, online meetings have increased 60% for some people. Um, we're constantly, like, I don't know about anyone else, but I constantly feel the need to check in on, you know, my sister and my parents. And at this point, it almost feels like a burden to have to, as terrible as it says, like as terrible as it sounds, but it just feels like a lot of work. It just feels like more mental work that I have to perform at the end of the day. Um, and so I do think that a lot of people are looking to be less bombarded by messaging online, uh, whether that's from brands, whether it's from friends. But I do think that one, one thing that people are actually really looking for is this kind of build up and anticipation. I think that's one thing that the pandemic has kind of stolen from us is that, you know, before this, this whole pandemic happened, we might think about like, oh, we've got a big, you know, event coming up at work or a conference and I'm really looking forward to that. So for like the next you know, four to six weeks, I'm gonna plan, I'm gonna like look at my travel, I'm gonna get excited about it. Um, you know, I'm planning a vacation at the end of summer. So I'm going to plan that and get really excited about that. That's all kind of just disappeared overnight. And so I think one way that brands can kind of help consumers feel a little happier and a little more confident is by lowering the number of communications, like slowing down the cadence of communications, but maybe creating these kinds of events and campaigns that are bigger and that build up over time so that mm -hmm. consumers have something that's more exciting to look forward to. And I think that Jamie's example of the tech brand that was inviting her and her family to be part of a comedy show, that's a perfect example of this because it's building up anticipation for something that's not brand related, it's not work related, it's an opportunity to kind of decompress, it's fun, it's relaxing, but it just gives you something to look forward to. Yeah, I definitely could see, I'd seen, um, uh, last year I was lucky enough to get a ticket for Glastonbury Festival in the UK, and uh, the BBC are actually this year doing, because obviously the, the festival's cancelled, it was their 50th anniversary, uh, they're, they're putting on, you know, uh, they're basically making their own lineup from previous, you know, 
from from previous festivals and they're kind of going to be putting it online and people can stream it and people can also recommend their favorite sets and all this kind of stuff um it's kind of nice to feel like oh well if you can't be there in person at least you could try and like you know lock it into your calendar or find the time of your day to like listen to feel like some of that nostalgia for like being in a place with yeah. loads of people and having that buzz of like a live event and um and you know and i think another interesting thing we see potentially is more longer format of content you know we're so used to these quick bites of like TikTok, instagram self-generated content and don't be wrong i'm i i totally am the millennial that has like gone into TikTok throughout this whole process like i i'm that that person that kind of just crept in um but um and that content's not going anywhere but i can see that potentially we might have more longer format content where people just put it on you know kind of whether it's part of like a ambience of home or um just a bit more of an immersive um bit of content compared to these shorter formats that we're, we've been generally seeing as a trend for the past like you know few years and I'm actually, I think it's interesting too, because, you know, a lot of people, when they talk about digitizing events, you know, basically taking the same format, having a lot of people having a panel discussion and just kind of replicating that real world experience online. But I think it's interesting to have brands that instead of trying to make it this sort of impersonal virtual event to make it more personal. I know that my son is really big into Broadway and he was begging me the other day for $200 because for $200 he can actually hire a cast member from Beetlejuice on Broadway to do like a 10 minute video chat with him and his friends. And I was like, first of all, that sounds like a pretty good deal. 200 bucks is not a ton of money. And secondly, like I just thought that was such a creative way for these producers and these, these organizations to find ways to still engage with fans, still make money, and still find, you know, like ways to kind of keep the show going on. It was so creative. And I think there are a lot of opportunities for brands to do similar things. Mm -hmm. I love that. I want a cast member to yeah. <laughs> You really want to obviously we, we don't want these kind of things to completely disappear it's always a struggle for the arts to be funded anyway and you know um depending on various cities struggle even more so with with funding art, arts and uh, and theater and things like that so it's like ways that we want to be able to preserve things to be able to come back to when things are more normal as well you know we still want to be able to go to those spaces and enjoy enjoy that kind of content for sure yeah and it's a fun way to kind of indulge in escapism too you know, there's a way to create content that's not so focused on the here and now of like, here's my brand, here's my product, here's my service. But there are ways to kind of tie into what I consider to be sort of daydream content. So, you know, like I've noticed that in the evenings, instead of like reading the news, which feels overwhelming and feels like a chore, that now I will scroll through Zillow and look at ridiculously priced homes that I can't afford because, you know, I'll just, I need some kind of daydream. I just need to like zone out for a little bit. And it's fun and it's a way for me to decompress. And brands can be a part of that. They can help people start planning for their dream vacation a year from now, or what's like the big home renovation that you're gonna do once things are back to normal. So there's a way to kind of tie into this whole escapism and help people like think about the future and get excited, excited about the future, um, but also keep your brand top of mind. I, I like the, that daydream content that you were you're just talking about. I think um, going back to the our, our days and trying to navigate working from home, um, I'm hoping that consumers start to take these more proactive efforts to break up their day, to go for a walk, to get outside, to engage with daydream content, and then as a brand, maybe maybe we can help facilitate that and start feeding in that type of content. To, um, to move that along. Uh, because I do think that people are for sure feeling fatigued when we just talk about who we are and what we do. Yeah. And people Absolutely. are, they can, they can tell if there's, you know, they know if you're, if you're just selling or if you really care about their well being. Um, so I like like the, the mission of daydream content um, and, and building that into your brand experience. Yeah, I agree. And I think that, you know, like even when we, even when you talk about kind of how to content, like how to navigate through this, people are really getting tired of that too. It's just, it's overwhelming. You know, at this point, I think we've lived enough through it that we have our own personal expenses or experiences. We know how we need to navigate through. And now it's like, how do we just mentally keep ourselves excited about the future and looking forward? Yeah. 
Perfect. Well, we've got here, um, Julia, let me see if I can bring this up on the screen. I think it should. There we go. Um, so Facebook had shared uh, this website. So this is for personalized messages from celebrities. <laughs> I just had to fit that in. Um, coming to a birthday near you sometime soon is going to be a personalized celebrity message. But I love that. Thank you, Julie. And I also just wanted to say um, hi to Elliot here who is watching from Charlotte. So thanks. And uh, good afternoon. Uh, for you, I guess, yeah, one thirty p.m. it would be over there. So thanks for um, for, <laughs> for sending your messages. Um, we're about out of time, actually. We're coming up on 45 minutes. So um, I just wanted, before we close up for today, if there was any other thoughts or any other points that you felt like you really just wanted to share um, today before we wrap up? No. <laughs> we're just going to have an awkward silence. Um, <laughs> I'd be away with four people on a chat. <laughs> I, have a, I have a few thoughts to end with. Um, I think it's important for brands to just look at the holistic view of what each individual is feeling um, in your audience um, and start maybe revisiting your customer journey based on that. I think that's a great idea. I think just finding ways to look at peripheral content, things that like activities and hobbies and topics that your audience is interested in, that's not directly applicable to your products and services, looking at ways that you could tie that in to provide some of that daydream comment content or um, just ways for people to kind of escape. Yeah, I, I like thinking about it, like how can, how can this, marketing content or this marketing program help make customers feel good. Um, so I feel like that's a, a great lens to, to add to it um, or when you're when you're designing your program. And also maybe we should all just buy a, a, uh, a cameo for someone and just pass it forward. <laughs> I have a couple of those. Some of them are actually. Harry Lauren, you want a cameo? Okay, I'll buy <laughs> I do actually want one. <laughs> well, I'll do those as favors for people who feature on the live stream. So there we go, you know. Well, uh, <laughs> um, well thank you so much to, to all of you for joining this morning. I appreciate you taking the time. Hopefully, I'm not adding to your, you know, cloud living fatigue and exhaustion um, and kind of join this hangout to, to chat a little bit about this. Um, I want to just uh, give the opportunity to show SMG's website here. So stuntandgimmicks.com, of course, is where Lauren um, is, is from, where she represents. She's a partner and CEO there. So if you want to find out more information about SMG, the types of content that they make, the services, also some great blog um, content there just to kind of dive into to have a look and see if there's any ideas that might help your company, uh, your business. So do check that out, stuntandgimmicks.com. Um, but thank you so much to, to all of you for joining and um, we'll uh, hopefully catch up again soon. Thank Thanks you. Having you. There we go. And one by one, I'll disconnect. Um, all right, so that's it for today's live stream for AdRoll Live. Um, I do want to say next week, we're going back to our kind of bit more regular format. Um, we're going to be chatting with Catch.co, who uh, deal with online finances. So they help streamline all of your um, financing for freelancers in one place. So we're talking, you know, um, tax and health benefits and all those things that perhaps, you know, when you're not working in a uh, full time job for a company, it's somewhat more streamlined for you. Their service really enables freelancers and contracts to manage better manage their finances. So uh, super excited to talk about the fight, you know, a, a company from a financial industry that's working direct to consumer, because that's something we've not had here on the live stream. Uh, but we'll share more content, more information about that soon. And I'm hoping by next week, I'll be in my new house. So maybe we won't have to deal with this ambience of, uh, of moving anymore. Uh, but thank you to everybody who's been watching. Thank you for uh, all of your comments and questions. Don't hesitate to get in touch, send your questions, comments. We'll get them answered to you from our in-house experts. And of course, we are on all of the social channels. We're on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. If you follow AdRoll there or go to adroll.com forward slash resources, you'll be able to find all of our um, our blogs, ebooks, webinars, resources there. So uh, do check it out. Thanks so much for watching.